Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we are continuing with the novel In Dominion by Dan Simmons. This is the third novel in his Hyperion Cantus and this is part four. For the first three parts of this novel and the first two novels in the series, there will be a link to a playlist at the end of the video. Before we begin, I would like to encourage you to subscribe if you haven't, give us a like, drop us a comment, and now, part four. Father Captain De Sawyer, Sergeant Gregorius, Corporal Key, and Lancer Rettig were tired of the constant death and resurrection. They had done it eight times in eight different star systems in the past 63 days. The first world that they visited was Tor City Center, which used to be the capital of the hegemony. Billions had died on that planet after the fall. They had no way of getting food all of their food was brought in via forecasters. And since there were giant buildings that were hundreds of stories tall that had no stairs or elevators that was only accessible via forecaster, tens of thousands had died because they starved to death with no way of getting down or fell to their death. By the time the packs had arrived 60 years after the fall, out of the tens of billions, just a few billion was left alive, and most of them became born-again Christians. The Archbishop of Tar City Center had become one of the most important and powerful humans in Pax space, and this power grew to be so large that the Vatican eventually excommunicated the Cardinal. Rules were then put in place so that that never happened again. Father Captain De Sawyer and his men were forced to spend eight days on Tar City Center because of the Archbishop, but he was able to put permanent guards on the portals and had cameras erected to monitor it 29 hours a day. The next planet they went to was Heaven's Gate in the Vega system. Heaven's Gate was once again a muddy, swampy planet with an unbreathable atmosphere. They also spent eight days on Heaven's Gate, and that was because the Farcaster portals were buried in mud over the past couple hundred years, and so he had them dug up so that they could put a guard on them. They also built domes to cover the portal and the guards. Next up was the system NGC ES 2629. There were eight planets in the system, and only one was habitable. The only humans on the planet were some visiting biologists, zoologists, tourists, and support teams that had been stranded after the fall and had gone native. There were only a few thousand humans on the planet, and there were a few RNA-seeded beasties that were capable of eating humans and did so often. There were three large rivers on the planet, and the Soya picked the longest one with the gentlest stretches, assuming that that would be where they would have put the tetis. On the fifth day, they found the portals. They decided to deep scan the jungle and the river to see if there was any way that the ship was hiding under the river or in the jungle. They found something buried under the river, but it turned out to be an old yacht from before the fall. There were ten skeletons in it. Two of them were kids. It looks as if they were stuck there after the fall and decided to commit suicide by opening all the hatches. They left some motion detectors at the portals and then took off. The next stop on the Sawyer's list was Barnard's World. Barnard's World had survived the fall in good shape. It had taken a bloody civil war and 212 years after the fall before the Pax could bring Barnard's World into its fold. And while almost all of the partisans have disappeared, there were still a few in the forest and the canyon areas. They found the tetis and the portals and no sign of the girl or her ship. After getting the archbishop to promise to keep an eye on the portals and on the river, they left. Next, they headed for Lakel 9352. In that system, the planet they came to see used to be called Sibiatu's Bitterness, but was renamed Inevitable Grace. It had a few Pax colonists that mined 
bauxite and sulfur. The planet had a thin methane ammonia atmosphere. The portals and the river was once covered by perpex tubes, but the tubes have long since fallen in and the water had boiled away and the planet's atmosphere had rushed in. Although it didn't seem as if she would ever come here, he put the last of the motion sensor beacons there just in case. At this point, Sergeant Gregorius asked him if they were really going to follow the itinerary that the Raphael had set for them because some of the worlds are way out in the outback and they were ruled by the ousters. He told them that they will decide when they get to that part. Then they left the system. The next system they jumped to was Omnicram 2. There were two planets in the system that was terraformed that was in a binary orbit. The Tetis went through both planets. De Sawyer did not really think that he would find a girl or her ship here because the sections of the Tetis went through military reservations on both planets. So it would be unlikely that the girl or the ship could have passed through within the last two months without being detected. But he wanted to take a look for himself. It was a good thing that he did because when the engineers and the church resurrection specialists examined the Raphael, they determined that there was small serious errors in the automated resurrection quiche and it took three days to make repairs. Once they left this system, they were headed to Mare Infinitus. They were on their last day at Mare Infinitus and they were headed to see the floating forecasters. Their pilot and guide was Lieutenant Baron Allen Sprawl, who was the Pax 70 Ophiochi Fleet Command Liaison, and he was giving them a verbal history lesson. And so when Gregorius asked him why the portals were so far apart, he proceeded to tell them. It seems that everything built on Mare Infinitus had keel weights and cables that trailed all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. So when the portals were built, their keel weights and cables was built to be able to sense volcanic activity that was happening under and around them, in which case they would migrate away from the danger area. So it was because of the volcanic activity in the area that the distance between the portals widened. After viewing the portals and they were heading back, he noticed that one of the platforms looked that it had some damage recently, so he asked about it, and the lieutenant proceeded to tell him that Station 326 had a poacher that tried to blow the place up a few tides ago. He goes on to tell them that the poachers are still engaged in a guerrilla warfare, that they are indigenous that were there since before the packs got here. The lieutenant went on to tell him that one man eight big tides ago, blew up some skimmers and tractors. He then told De Sawyer that eight big tides ago translated into two standard months. He goes on to tell them that the poacher was apprehended and shot and killed by the guards when he tried to get away. But it was when the lieutenant mentioned that the poacher had a own flying carpet that the Sawyer realized and made the connection and headed back to the platform. On the platform, he questioned the director, who was a PAX captain named C. Dabbs Pole. After questioning the director, who claimed that the poacher was dead and his remains were fed to the sharks, they smashed open his cabinet and found that he had the Harkin mat hidden in there. The Sawyer had the captain arrested for admitting the fact that he had found the Harkin mat and keeping it. Father Captain De Sawyer now feels that they're on the right track in chasing the girl. Once Wall was led into that big, bright, crowded room, the jig was up. He tried to bluff his way, but eventually got caught out and had to fight his way out. He managed to get out of the room still handcuffed and, while being shot at, dropped off the platform to the pipes below it. He managed to make it to where he hid the mat, unrolled it, got onto it, and began trying to fly away. He was trying to stay just above the wave tops. He could see that there was 
a parks officer, the same lieutenant that had him in the water, and he was surrounded by large shark-like animals. He reached down and pulled the lieutenant up onto the mat. He was about to detonate the explosives when the lieutenant he tried to save stabbed him with a knife. So while he and the lieutenant was fighting, the knife accidentally hit the transmit button, causing the explosives to detonate. In the fight, Rawl jumped into the water, leaving the lieutenant on the Hawking mat. As the lieutenant was flying the mat back to the platform, his own men shot and killed him. When his body fell off the mat into the water, the shark things attacked and finished him off, and his men above grabbed the Hawking mat. Rawl began swimming north, away from the platform. Rawl swam while fighting off attacks by the shark things. And just as his energy was running out, he was found by Ania and Betik, who pulled him up onto the raft, saving him. Since Roll had lost a lot of blood and was going into shock, they gave him something to knock him out so that they can get his vital signs stabilized. When he woke up, he was on Hebron. They told him that they were looking to get him medical aid, that he had some sort of infection that the multispectrum they had couldn't handle. They were puzzled because Hebron was not supposed to be part of the river Tetis. They put him under again and once he awakened he was floating through the capital New Jerusalem. The entire city was empty. It looked as if it has been abandoned recently, just a few months ago. Hebron was supposed to have fallen to the ousters about three years ago. Food had been left out and was all spoiled. The ones in the fridge were still cold. Tables were set in some of the houses. Hollow pits was humming with static. Radios were hissing, but there were no people, and there was no sign of any violence. Ania felt that something terrible happened there. They found a medical center and were able to cure Rawl. Another day, and he would have died from his infection. They were on Hebron for 13 days, and it took most of that time for the hospital to cure him rebuild his limbs and rehabilitate him so he could use them once again. In that time, he recited to Ania what Martin wanted him to do. Martin wanted him to protect her, get her home, find old earth and bring it back so he could see it before he died. He also wanted him to talk to the ousters, destroy the packs, overthrow the church, and find out what the technical was up to and stop it. She also informed him that everything on the planet was empty, not even a dog, cat, or horse was left behind. None of their private and personal junk was taken. On the 13th day, when they were ready to leave, Rawl tried to get them to take a boat or an EMV, but they resisted and they ended up leaving on the raft instead. Then they hopped on the raft and went through the portal to their next planet. Once through the portal, it was dark, the temperature dropped at least 70 degrees, and the gravity increased. Once they got their lights on, it seemed that they were in an ice cave with no visible way out. Father Captain De Soya uses the papal disc key to place the entire station 326 under house arrest and declare it a crime zone. He brought in troops and ships from the floating city of St. Teresa and put the entire garrison and fishing guests on the house arrest. When the bishop in charge of St. Teresa complained, he had the planetary governor, Archbishop Jane Kelly, threaten him with excommunication. Then brought in investigators and forensic experts from St. Teresa and other large city platforms to carry out crime scene studies. They quickly found out that many of the officers and men on this platform had been conspiring with poachers to allow illegal catches of local game fish to steal Pat's equipment. He had the blood on the Hawking mat tested and it was found to, to belong to two different people. One was Lieutenant Bellius and the other one was an unknown individual. Then had every poacher within a thousand kilometer radius rounded up and questioned. When the bishop came to try and stop him, he had the bishop arrested and posted 9,000 kilometers away near the polar ice caps. He was able to identify 
all of the different fingerprints except for the one which he set aside with the unidentified DNA evidence. He brought in two deep sea submersibles to dive down and try and retrieve the remains of the lieutenant or the unidentified man. He sent Sergeant Gregorius back to Hyperion with the DNA and the fingerprint information to see if he could identify anyone from Hyperion. He sent him using the Raphael so that he could get there and back as quickly as possible. When Sergeant Gregorius got back, they had identified the unknown DNA as belonging to Royal in Dominion. He was supposed to have died by execution in 3126. Yet his DNA and fingerprints were found here on Mare Infinitus. The Sawyer had them examine the Farcaster portal, but he was told there was no way that he could get into it or see if it was activated or where anyone who went through it would have gone. He also had the bottom searched and all the creatures within a 200 mile kilometer radius killed and their stomach contents searched. Now it is time for them to leave Mere Infinitus and he thinks he has come up with a new search pattern. Their raft drifted to the distant wall of the ice cavern. Amir wondered why the river was still liquid, but it turns out that the river water had a high salinity. They turned off all of their lamps, hoping that there would be a light showing through the ice, showing them their way out, but it was pitch black. They wrapped themselves in thermal blankets and turned up their heating cubes as hard as they could go. They figured out that they were probably on the planet Sol Draconi Septum because they were on an ice world and the gravity was high and that gravity is, should be 1.7 g. On this planet, most of the atmosphere had frozen solid. It seems that the river was extended to this world because of the possibility of encountering an arctic wraith. The wraith is something that lives on the surface, is very fast and deadly, and was almost extinct during the web days, but has made a comeback. And it eats the human residents, which are indigenous colonists that have gone native centuries ago that survived the fall and went back to primitive ways. It seems that back in the web days, this river was on the surface. They decided to go back up river to see if there was a way out that way. When they got there, they saw there was no way out that way, so they allowed the river to take them back down. Since the current kept going, it seems that the river continued on the, the ice wall. It was decided that Rawl would dive in, dive on the, the ice wall, get to the other side, and using plastic explosive, blow a hole through the wall so that the raft could come through. So Rawl jumped in, and just before he was pulled on the, he said this might not be such a good idea. Then he was pulled under. Father Captain de Sawyer and his men decided where to go next. The father wanted to abandon Raphael's search pattern and go straight to one of the ouster captured systems. He decided to program the Raphael to self-destruct if it was ever in danger of being captured. That way they could keep one of the pack's secret weapons out of enemy hands. So they checked to see what the first ouster occupied Tetis world would be, and it turns out it was Hebron. So they strapped in and headed off. But when the captain woke up, he noticed something was wrong. He checked around, and he noticed that he was not in his ship. Rather, he seems to be in a bed at the Vatican, looking at Father Baggio. He is the resurrection chaplain. The last thing he could remember was leaving Mere Infinitus and jumping. When he tried to ask questions, Father Baggio told him to rest. There'll be time to discuss everything later. Later that day, Father Baggio still wouldn't answer any questions, but told him that Father Farrell will be coming soon. Later that afternoon, Father Farrell arrived. He was the commander in the Legionnaires of Christ. Father Farrell told him that Sergeant Gregorius and Corporal Key was well but that Lanceretic died through death and last rites was administered and that his body was consigned to the depths of space. He said there seems to have been a problem with the automated resurrection quiche upon the Raphael's return from the Hebron system. He goes on to say that the Raphael appeared to have carried out 
his programming found no immediate opposition during deceleration and went into orbit around Hebron. All four of those on board was close to full resurrection when the ship had to flee the system. Secondary resurrection after incomplete resurrection is more difficult and that's where the failure happened. When Father Farrell said that his ship, the Raphael, went back to the mere infinita system, the Sawyer was confused because he had programmed it so that it would go to the Svoboda system if it had to leave the Hebron system prematurely. It seems that after the Raphael had gone to the mere infinita system, Captain Margaret Wu was there and she thought it would be a much better idea to keep him and his men from being resurrected there. So she brought him back to Passam to be resurrected. Father Farrell wouldn't explain why it took 30 days instead of just three to get back to Passam. He then told the Sawyer that he's here to extend an invitation to meet the Cardinal Secretary and the Monsignor at 0700 tomorrow. After Father Farrell had left, the Sawyer knew that he was going to be in front of the sacred congregation of Universal Inquisition. And now that he has to appear before them, he doesn't know what he's been accused of. We will stop here and continue this in a future video. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.